Okay, so welcome back. And what we, we so we were in the middle of discussing support vector machine, which is in chapter five. And what we are going to do today is to study the dual form of support vector machine algorithm. And also we will study that you can say a generalization of the simple support vector machine algorithm that we studied before to, I mean, to a more general case where, I mean, if the, in the textbook it's called non-separable case where we may have no way to avoid an error, okay? So, so goal today is to understand dualization. or dual form of support vector machine. And then also the other thing was non-separable case. You can say this is the most more general form of support vector machine. So here's a quick reminder of what we studied before. So, we said the, the idea of support vector machine is derived geometrically. So it's really coming from the maximizing the margin. So in, a, in other words, so-called max margin classifier, that's what support vector machine tried to achieve. But the but then the real the realization of this idea is done by various manipulation of optimization. So via this series of uh, manipulations of the optimization objective, we will end up with the following form of support vector machine for the separable case. So the input in this case is S, which is a pairs, I mean, M pairs of X and Ys. And then the support vector machine solved the following optimization problem. This optimization problem is minimizing the weight and the uh, intercept or slope and intercept, uh, but the objective is to minimize the slope the size of the slope, and then under the condition that subject to all these examples should be cl classified correctly with enough confidence. Okay, so this condition says that the the prediction of the uh, uh, prediction of the hypothesis constructed by our this, this algorithm, which is given by this guy, and then the actual label of the sample yi, they should be of the same sign. Furthermore, the prediction should be confident enough. So this yi is either plus one and minus one. And then we, we are requiring not just it's a greater than zero, but also we are saying this has to be greater than equal to one. So it has to be reasonably confident. Okay, so that's what this number one is capturing. And, and then as I said, this is derived geometrically from the idea of maximizing the margin. But at the same time, we can also understand this algorithm from purely the optimization perspective. We say that the, this condition, subject to condition, means they classify, um, let me use this first essentially say zero empirical error. With confidence. With enough confidence. So that's what this condition is telling us. Try to find a hyperplane that, that achieves zero empirical error, but it has to have some enough confidence. 
And the, the other objective tells us that it minimizes the model complexity. So it follows roughly the idea of the model selection idea that we said before. Okay. Then SVM in the separable case, it solved this optimization problem. And then once it solved the optimization problem, it can return WMB directly, or it can form a classifier by using WMB and then return that classifier. Okay. So the algorithm that I told you is returning this function. Uh, it forms the function f using uh, this WMB. So let's call it W star and B star. And then you form another function, H using F, which is, let's call it F star. I'll just call it H star. So sign of star of x, then finally return h star. But that's the, uh, the, the idea of the algorithm. So, so then what we're gonna, okay. So why we want to study the dual version of this algorithm? And one of the reason is I, I mean, when I introduced the, uh, well, give, uh, give some overview of support vector machine algorithm, I said, the support vector machine work algorithm only works on the inner products between uh, the xi and xj, which are the examples in the sample or in the training set. Also the predictor that we're gonna produce, so the hypothesis we're gonna produce, we'll only use the inner product. But in this primary form, that's not really the case. So this is a primary form. This is not the case. We have to, I mean, this pri in the primary form algorithm, we compute, something like a W. And then when you compute the inner products of the, uh, for instance, in a, a, the hyperplane that, that we construct, you compute the inner product of a W star and X. It's not an inner product between X and the training set. It's just, it's just something else. So we have to build W star. Why this is, a, I mean, potentially kind of limiting. One reason is if we are working on the infinite dimensional space, we can't really construct W because I mean, W is an infinite dimensional vector, right? So if things are stated in the pro this primer form, that works well in certain scenario, but that doesn't work well in other scenario where we want to use very, very expressive input space. So input space is really, it's a space of the features. So if we want to use infinite dimensional feature space, so then this primary form doesn't really work. Okay. And also if you study the dual form, that will help us to understand the behavior of this algorithm more deeply. So here, here's, so here's the idea that what we're gonna do. So we'll take this primary form and study the dual form. And then the dualization is really about the dualizing this optimization objective, which is, uh, which is given here. So dualizing this is what we're gonna do. So how we're gonna do it? So let's move to the next. So the key idea of dualization is that we're gonna use is Lagrangian. And also if we do the dual form, the notion of support vectors becomes clear. So this dual optimization is essentially from the perspective of optimization, it does the same thing. It, try, it compute the same value, but it's stated with respect to different space. Okay. And uh, the space is really space closely related to each samples. The original space is a uh, optimization is happening with respect to the space, the input space. 
the, the dual form optimization happens with respect to the number of samples in some sense. Okay. So, so here's how the key idea of getting dual, dual form is to use this case, the Lagrangian. and Lagrange variables. And then Lagrange variables are introduced for each of the each of the inequalities that that we have. So I think we have to I have to write it again this objective is WP. Yeah, subject to for i. So I will write it in a form that's more kind of the it's a kind of form that where we can apply this Lagrangian construction of Lagrangian Lagrange variable uh, almost automatically or systematically is given like this. I. So like this. So this means because we have a uh, m examples, there are m uh, inequalities in our constraint. Okay. So what we're gonna do? So this idea of Lagrangian is for each of these constraints, like uh, for each i, we introduce Lagrange variables, okay, which is called alpha i. So this means that we have uh, m new variables and all these Lagrange variables are greater than equal to zero. And then we introduce, so that's correspond to Lagrange variables. And then the now Lagrangian is the one that incorporate so this Lagrangian is the one that incorporates the older constraints as well as the optimization objective in one, I mean, in one form. So if we want to construct a one function that incorporate all of these, and so it, all of this, and that's done by uh, like this. The, so what we, the systematic method is say, we define a function that take all the variable in the optimization, like a WMB. Also we take all the variable in the, uh, all the Lagrange variables. So we, if we write alpha to be alpha one to alpha m, this Lagrangian take alpha. And then what's the form of this Lagrangian? It's, it's written as the standard objective that we have, plus we take for each of the inequality which is zero less than something, we take the right-hand side of this inequality and multiply it with the corresponding Lagrange variables and add it to a part of the Lagrange. So there are M such constraint. And then for each of the constraints, we have a multiply Lagrange variables with the right-hand side of the zero less than something. So we have one minus by i w x i plus b this let's make this a bit larger okay so so the, this is Lagrangian and so, so what, what's the big deal so if we do so then we can express the original optimization problem like this. Instead of just, so we can essentially get rid of this complicated constraint from, and then we can, in a sense, rephrase this constraint in terms of optimization. So the one above is the same as, we say, uh, actually it's not maximum, it's a minimum. Check. Okay, minimum much right. 
So then we, instead of minimum, let me just use infimums. So if you don't worry about like existence of maximal element, you can just interchange infimum and supremum with the, the minimum and maximum. So that's not a problem, but if you are quite careful about whether maximum or minimum actually exists, using infimum and supremum is a bit safer option. So that's what we do. So we have a W and B. So essentially this minimum and infimum say the same thing. But instead of writing down the constraint, we replace it by the supremum over alpha. And then we write this, our new objective, which is Lagrangian, the alpha. And then we have a constraint say all these alpha i has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So then what happens? What happens is that if one of the constraints gets violated, so like, so if one of the inequality here it gets violated, then the corresponding term here can, which means that this the, I mean, this one minus yi something is going to be minus. Okay. So then when we apply this supremum, we can pick alpha i and make alpha i really, really large. That means that we make this L part to become minus infinity, okay? Oh. oh, no, no, I was wrong. Violated means one minus y i something is going to be positive. Now, if one minus y i is positive, so this part is positive. If we pick really large alpha i, then the, this, the term alpha i times this one minus y i that's going to be very, very large. So if you take a supremum, that's going to go to the infinite. So the, from the perspective of outside optimization, which is taking the infimum, that kind of infinite case will be excluded. So if W and B violate this constraint, that means the inner optimization will return uh, infinity. So that case will never contribute to the, to the computation of this infimum. Okay, it will just get kind of excluded automatically. So this is a way of encoding constraint in terms of optimization. But for the Lagra, I mean, for this specific case of support vector machine, it turns out, okay, so be before actually talking about this, then there's actually one simple manipulation that we can do, which is if you replace, the supremum and infimum, we get something smaller. So WD, why this is that? I mean, one way to see this is look at, I don't think I know how to use a spotlight, but let me finish. Okay, so one way to see this is now just compare this infimum and this entire thing. For any specific alpha, if you just compute the infimum of the Lagrangian with respect specific alpha, that will be smaller than equal to the, what happens on the left-hand side of this inequality. That is because the left-hand side, we are computing the supremum. So just choosing one alpha, I mean, will be worse than compute using the supremum there, okay? Now, for every alpha, we have an inequality. So that's why we have this uh, less than equal for, for if, even when we take the supremum outside. So this inequality is always true no matter what, but sometimes, this inequality becomes equality. And I mean, the exact conditions or some version of the condition is expressed in the textbook. So roughly speaking, if our origin optimization objective in the original problem is convex, and then the conditions that we have 
are all com constructed from the linear inequality. So in that case, we can switch this infimum and supremum. That's not going to change the, uh, I mean, if it, even then you change infimum and supremum, we will still have an equality. Okay. Sometimes, and then, so this support vector machine is one of the case where we have inequality, this equality. And that will be the case when we study the more general version of support vector machine that we are studying right now for the so-called uh, non-separable case. So that is something nice that we can exploit. And another nice thing about this is that actually, so we can, so we, we have an equality. Let's replace this equation equality. But actually, we can even make this a bit simpler. We can characterize. So, so by the way, this equal if infimum and supremum is, can I mean, actually can be replaced. Can, I mean, there are solution for this optimization actually exists. So, if infimum can be replaced by minimum, supremum can be replaced by maximum. Okay. So then the I mean the, the, the solutions will be the same as well. So one that solves on the right hand side will solve the left hand side, and so on. The, right, but then there is actually something more interesting, which is now if you put some condition there, so we have the same supremum and infimum. Alpha i greater than equal to zero. But now suppose that is we add something extra. We say we, this W and B have to satisfy some property. WB, which is related to alpha. Okay. Suppose we put some condition here. So this is the new part. If we do it, now what we are doing, I mean, we are when you compute the infimum, we are restricting the domain of the infimum. So typically what we get is I mean, instead of equality, we get something larger. So this is what we typically get because I mean, when you compute the infimum, we are considering kind of fewer possibility. Considering more possibility will produce something small. But it turns out there are some conditions that we can impose that won't change this, I mean, this optimization at all. So in other words, optimal values that satisfy on the left-hand side, I mean, they, in some sense, it's going to be, it will satisfy the property that I'm just explaining. So you can view it this way, or you can say just prop, there are some property, if you, even then you impose it, things don't change. So what are those properties? So that we, instead of less than equal, this one, we can actually put equality here. So what is this property? That property is this KKT condition. This is not always possible. I mean, there are sometimes that this fails, but again, if the optimization objective is convex, the constraint is just conjunction of linear inequality, then we can impose this condition. And if you do so, we can use this property to simplify I mean, this optimization problem. So what are these conditions? This condition say the Lagrangian, so the, what, what are the property that we can use the impose there? The, the property is if we take a derivative of Lagrangian with respect to the original variable, which is W and B, that has to be equal to zero. This is an extra condition, right? I mean, the, we initially our optimization doesn't have this condition. But this KKT condition is a necessary condition for the optimization problem, solution of the optimization problem. You say, I mean, if W and B, if, even when you impose this uh, con extra constraint, it doesn't change okay, anything about the optimization problem. And the third one say that for all the original, the constraint, we have the alpha i times the one minus y i. Okay. 
sp, that has to be equal to zero. So in other words, the constraint should be, in a sense, satisfied uh, very tightly. Okay, so this is the, the, the condition. I mean, when we multiply with alpha i. So these are the three properties that we can impose. So what we're gonna do is that we will impose, I mean, only these two properties and then use the third one later when we analyze the solution, okay? Now, suppose we want to impose these two properties. So then, the, if we impose these two properties, the, then the, if you take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to W, so here's our Lagrangian, if you take the derivative with respect to W and set is equal to zero. So then this implies that if you take the derivative, the, I mean the one over, I mean this term becomes just W and the other term, there is one W here. So then the, what, because it's depend on the linear, this uh, y i alpha i x i survive when you take the derivative. So that part gives us summation of i equal to one to m alpha i y i x i, and that's the gradients of the Lagrangian with respect to w, and the condition that that has to be equal to zero. So if you rephrase this condition, that means W, if it restricts the domain of this infimum calculation, where W is always equal to this constraint, that won't change the optimization problem at all. Also the solution of optimization will always satisfy this con condition. So for the second, if we take a derivative with respect to P, that means, I mean, the, this first term disappears. The only term that survives is coming from here. And then the, the coefficients, so the, the coefficients that remains is of V is Yi and the alpha I. So we do the calculation what we get is sum of alpha i, y i is equal to zero, where i is equal to one through n. So what are we gonna do? So we will impose these two conditions, okay, w, and then put it there as a property. So if you do so, then, I mean, we know that w and uh, these two conditions are true. So using these two conditions, we can rewrite this Lagrangian. Let's do this rewriting. So if you do this rewriting, then here's what we're gonna get. So can scream on alpha minimum of WB. But actually, I mean, this infimum doesn't, it's not really proper optimization. I mean, it's a very trivial optimization because we know that what W has to be. W has to be alpha i, y i, x i, or i. Then we also know that uh, some other condition, which is alpha i, y i, this one has to be equal to zero. So using this condition, if we rewrite the Lagrangian, the first part of the Lagrangian is uh, one half the W square and plug in I mean, this characterization of W that that gives us one over two. And essentially, I mean, it's just multiplication of this, the W in terms of sum by the same sum, I and J both goes from one to M, alpha I for J, Y I, Y J, and X I, X J in the product. Then now we have a sum of alpha I, I is equal to one to M, 
So that's coming from so this number one. And then the other part is we have alpha, alpha, alpha i, y i, and then the, I mean, the inner product part. But if we plug in the definition of w, that will give us sum, which is minus summation of i coming from the outside, j for definition of w, i over j, y i. J, x i, x b. And then the last part is we have sum of i is equal to one to m alpha i, y i, y i b. Surely this is minus. But if we do so, then we can now use few things to simplify. So you can use, I mean, this to get rid of this. I mean, this is now, B is nothing to do with the index I, so this whole part will disappear. So if we do the simplification, and then this part will come, cross it out. Oh, oh well, I don't have, you know what, how one do things, so. That part will disappear. And then now it's a, if you see the first part, and then the last part are exactly the same, except the one, we have one over two, the other case with minus. So the objective will become minus one over two. And then we can get rid of the second part. So, so the final answer we get is this one. Just write some color. So that's an objective that we get. Now from this objective, you can see that W disappeared completely, B disappeared completely. So it's an infimum over W and B over some constant from the perspective of W and B. So we can get rid of WMB. Then now W doesn't appear anywhere and then the choice of W can always, always be made to make this equality true. So, so this equality can always be made to true. So you can get rid of this as well. For, for the other concern, actually the infimum, I mean, here, it strictly speaking matters because if this constraint is not satisfied, then this infimum will mean that, yeah, so this infimum will produce a minus infinity. I mean, there is nothing that satisfies this constraint, then it's gonna be minus infinity. So what we can do is, I mean, we don't, so because we are taking supremum outside, that kind of a case we will be excluded. So, we buy the outermost supremum. So we move this constraint to the outer, outer case and then get, can get rid of infimum here. So we can get rid of infimum. And maybe now I can do it. Sorry about this. So we move that constraint to the, as a part of the constraint for supremum, that means alpha i, y i. So the order manipulation that I have done are essentially exploiting this property and simplify this optimization, the property simplify the optimization. And the form that we got, this is the dual form of support vector machine. This is the dual form, which is high right. So that's the dual form. 
And you can see that this dual optimization is done. So you can notice a few things. The first dual optimization, I mean, W and so on, they disappeared completely. It's all optimization with respect to just alpha. Okay, so that's a one interesting aspect of this optimization. The second, in the optimization, the, if you see how the, the XIs are used, okay, the information of XI is always, it's, I mean, given by your inner product. So we, we don't really use access XI directly. We only access XI by the inner product. So if we know how to compute the inner products between the inputs of the given examples in the training set, so then we can solve this optimization problem. I mean, assuming this optimization has a solution. So from the perspective of this optimization, the only thing that matters is the, this condition, the, I mean, the inner product. Okay. Okay, so that's a dual form of the support vector machine. Now, suppose we solve this dual form. Okay. So, so, so then how from the solution of, so suppose this is supremum is, actually attained by some specific alpha i. And so we solve this optimization problem by some particular alpha. So then how can you use it to, I mean, to restore W and B and so on? Just write it here. I think writing everything in the one slide is a bit better. So suppose that, I mean, so this is the, the form. Screen. So suppose we solve this. So then now the question is, how we can reconstruct the, the line from here. And that construction can be done by the, this KKT condition that we talked about. So we said one of the conditions, suppose, so, so suppose alpha. Alpha contains the supremum of the right left hand side, we need this optimization problem. So then also suppose that the n alpha of i0 for some uh, sum i0 is, is not equal to zero. Suppose that is the case. Now from once, if we have some solution, which typically happens, then we can use it to construct the, I mean, understand about the line that we, the hyperplane that we originally think about. How do, how we can think about this? W in this case is going to be defined by i from one to m alpha i, i on x i. And then the, the b will come from this condition. So if alpha i zero is not equal to zero, so then because the, the multiple is zero, the, the other side, the one minus the y i something, so this part has to be equal to zero. So, so that means, for, for this specific I0, can we have a one is equal to Y I0, W X I0 plus B. So if you multiply Y I0 both sides, so we have Y I0, square because y, y is either plus and minus one. Y i zero square, I mean, this one is equal to one. 
So from this, we can say B has to be Y I zero minus W X I zero. So, okay. so, so now using this W and B, we can think about the hyperplane. So this hyperplanes, so this is gonna be F star of X, it's defined W, you write it W star and B star. W star of X plus B star. But now W is of this form. So if you plug in this W and expand this user linearity of the inner products, we get this one. Y i x i and x for b star we have uh, y i zero and then we also plug in w then this becomes i is equal to one so m alpha i y i x i but instead of just j we have x i zero. So, so you can see that I said that by solving this optimization problem, we are only using the inner products between xi and xj, the, the examples in the given sample. Same in the, some similar way, whenever, when we use what we learn during the optimization, which is this hyperplane, and when given a new input, the computation that happens by this hyperplane will only involve the inner product, so which is between the new input x and xi, or given between the xi and xi0. Okay. So this dual version uh, optimization, as well as the final outcome, which is the, the hyperplane, which we'll use to form a hypothesis, both of them only use the inner product between the axis in the examples in the training set, or in the given sample, or the inner product between the something in the training set or something in the given sample and the new input x step for which you want to make a prediction. And now, finally, the there is actually one last bit which is quite important. So finally, if you now think about the definition of W star. Only alpha i, who's, I mean, only the xi, whose alpha i is non zero, that make a contribution in W star. So if alpha i is equal to zero, I mean, this, this its contribution on W will be zero, right? So it's just not contribute the formation of this hyperplane at all. The same way, if alpha i is zero, I mean, its contribution for B will also be zero, right? So the alpha i, whose the so alpha i whose value is not zero, they, they are the one which make which make the important role in the formation of W star and the B star and eventually the hyperplane that we learned in this algorithm. So the xi so with this value, the whose corresponding Lagrange variable is non-zero, they are called the support vectors. Uh, and this is another important concept. So let me just highlight. So I think the way I'm using colors is not very consistent, but this is another important bit. So then these support vectors are the one that matters quite a lot. So in some sense, what really happened is that, I mean, it tried to identify the really important bit of the information from the input, okay? So it discards some of the inputs, which are do not really, which are not important. It will only identify only some of the important information of the input automatically. and that is in some sense why, I mean, that, that together with this max margin, which are related, 
they are the reasons why the support vector machine has, I mean, in some sense, generalized very well and has a very nice guarantee on in terms of generalization. Okay, so so that's the dual version of optimizations as well as this support uh, the idea of support vectors. And I said, if you view the dual version, it becomes clear that this algorithm only uses inner products. And then also if you look at the dual version, you can see that only support vectors matters. Okay, so inputs whose alpha is non-zero, which are called support vectors, they are the one that matters for training as well as prediction. Okay, so so okay. So that's kind of formed the one part of the story. Now let's move to the next part. Next part is we learn about support vectors, but suppose we want to use these support vectors in practice. Okay, I mean, can we use it? And actually it turns out we can't really use support the algorithm that we studied. That's because often in the real world, the separability assumption, which means that there is a linear line, a hyperplane that divides positive and negative example, that doesn't, I mean, that, that often fails. Okay. I mean, even when you use a really high dimensional space, that assumption, there is a hyperplane that divides positive and negative example that fails. So, so this support vector machine for the non-separable case is the one that designed to cope with such a general scenario. Now what's the idea? So, is it separability assumption? It fails in practice often. And uh, so we need a we need to generalize. So what's the idea? I mean, if you again view this as a what we learned from the model selection, the idea is quite simple. I mean, the, what we learned about model selection, the key high level idea is we try to minimize the empirical risk as well as model complexity at the same time. So that will give us, so in a sense, that will allow us to search for the right hypothesis set and then search a good hypothesis at the same time very well. So if the, the, the separable case of SPM is the one where empirical risk can be made to zero, right? we can reduce the empirical risk part, error part to be zero. So we can focus on the model complexity part. So if we can't really reduce the empirical risk to zero, so then we can form a new objective where if empirical risk is small, so then, I mean, they, we can say the, what algorithm finds, I mean, the hypothesis is, is well, not what algorithm finds, but if empirical risk is, is a small, we can, for some hypothesis, we can, we just say this hypothesis is good. So in other words, we form a proper objective where we have a model complexity part and the empirical risk part at the same time. So that in some sense, an idea of SVM from kind of one perspective. And then the, the, gen, the SVM for the non-separable case. And then the key idea of realizing this is to use so-called select variables, but this is really a measure of the empirical error, okay? So I will explain what it is. So the user select variable, so what called the psi i. And this intuitively, this is select variable measures. I mean, some version of empirical error. Okay. So, so let me just write down the new objective used by this SVM. So SVM. Then explain how all things work. So the ob objective is given like this. It maximize. So 
the W B psi. So if the I mean the maximization doesn't exist, it you can think of it uh, not actually maximize, minimize. We minimize some form of error and mod plus model complexity. And if there is not doesn't exist, then we can think of it as a taking compute trying to compute the infimum. And uh, this minimization is for the has a usual part from our SVM. This measures the complexity of the model that we are in some sense. And then, but it also have another part, so constant C together with other part, psi i to the power of p. So here, p is some constant greater than or equal to one. And p can be equal to one, p can be equal to two, and so on. But this, the power p, is, I mean, this, this term that we are adding, they are really about the measuring the empirical risk. Some, I mean, the more stricter version of empirical risk. Okay, and then that things is encoded by the subject two condition. So this subject two condition said for every i, every examples, is this we say the, this psi i should measure. I mean, write it in a different way, but essentially this means psi i should measure the the, the error. Okay, so said. Uh, y i times psi w plus b. So be beforehand we said this has to be greater than or equal to one, but now we are taking we are allowing some gap by psi i. Okay, and we also have condition psi i should be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So that's the new objective for SVM and for the general case. And that's, so for SVM for the general case, I mean, what we'll solve this optimization problem. They compute WB psi, and then they, what, uh, what it does is that it form hyperplane exactly the same way using computed optimal value star and then hypothesis h star is just a sign of star of x then in return h star but i said the psi i this is called a select variable and uh, but they are i said they are really trying to measure the the, the error then you can see, I mean, this formation is convenient when you dualize it and so on. I mean, you, you, you will dualize this form as well. That will reveal some more, kind of give us some more insight about what's really going on. But to understand this opti op optimization objective, you just can do like this. The important bit is this optimization objective. So to understand this optimization objective, it's quite good to rethink about the, the I mean, think about uh, trying to get rid of some variable. So suppose we try to get rid of a psi. Okay. Now, because this is, we have a psi i times power of p, if psi i is small, then we can achieve the minimum. Okay. Now, this constraint, I'm really saying giving a lower bound of psi i one minus y i psi w plus b. Okay. So if we I mean we have a two lower bound of psi i, one is it has to be greater than or equal to zero, and the other has to, it has to be greater than or equal to the one on the right hand side. So the psi i given w and b psi i that will minimize the quantity in our optimization objective is going to be the one that take the maximum the smallest value that sets by both constraint which is a maximum of zero one minus y i x i 
W plus V. So that will be the op optimization objective. So if you plug in this into the objective, then this objective is equivalent. To following, which said we minimize WMP on the square this, then the, we have C times I is equal to one to M max over zero. M minus pi i sine w plus b. And then, uh, and then we don't have any condition at all. So, but then the, the right hand side, you know, the power of p, I mean, it's that's the same as, uh, let's just say p is equal to 1. So that's all. But then, I mean, if we introduce a function v of x such that this is max of 0, 1 plus x, I mean, this, this looks like this, go to 0, and then from minus 1, it starts to grow and goes like this. And so we can rewrite this part to be V of minus uh, Yi okay. psi W plus B. And I'm sure, I mean, most of you already perhaps forgot about when we, when we discuss about the I mean, optimizations, like at the end of the model selection part, we said if our risk, we said our risk, the risk part is non-convex, which make optimization very difficult. So we can think about convex surrogate objective, which is defined by uh, uh, some convex function, convex non-decreasing function, and so on. And this is exactly the recipe. So this, this right-hand side, as you see, I mean, that's same as what I wrote here. That's exactly following the recipe. We are really trying to minimize the risk, empirical risk, but that's a hard function to, I mean, it's not an easy function to optimize. So we replace it by some convex function, in this case, using V, of v minus something. And, and that's how they, they, they I mean, the, the, the part, I mean, this side part of the, the support, support vector machine for the non separable case. The support vector machine for the non separable case is, I mean, commonly presented in this form. But then the, I, I say all these things to, so that you can see the connection between what's going on here and the big theme, which is the algorithm is designed by minimizing some form of the model complexity and some form of empirical error. And the same high level principle is followed by this support vector machine for the non separable case. And also we are using the another tool set that we learned, which is if optimization is very hard, we replace the optimization by the convex function. And in this case, the same thing is happening. Although the really the motivation is coming from. No, no, I, I, I didn't remove P. I just think about specific case of p. I mean, you can if p is equal to two, I mean, we this v that I define will be different. So this is. So Taeyong asked, the p can be removed. I mean, no, it's not true. So here, this is only for p is one case. If p is two case. I think the objective will be different. If p is two case. I mean, you can do the same thing, but we we will have a square here. So I think generally it's going to be yeah, square. And by the way, I mean, this function phi is called the hinge loss that we studied before. 
Okay, so that's a new optimization problem. And now I mean, so you can solve this optimization problem and the, so that's a one implementation of a support vector machine in the general case. But we can dualize this new optimization problem. That will give us a new insight. I mean, that will first give us a new version of the algorithm that works on only inner products. Second, that will give us a new insight, which help us to see the connection between the SVM that we studied before and the SVM that I just presented here. So let's dualize this. So I think maybe. Again, dualization. So the objective we have here is we want to minimize WB psi model complexity part. And then we have something related to the empirical risk. And then we'll consider P is equal to one case. And then subject to, we have uh, four I, we have a two constraint. One is psi, psi I has to be non-negative. And then the other constraint say, the other inequality set, uh, so, Let's write it in this form. Let's write in the form that where we can apply Lagrangian easily. So zero minus psi i. So one minus psi i minus uh, y i psi. W plus uh, B. So, so then we do that exactly the same recipe, but now for follow the same recipe, what is the recipe? Recipe is to introduce Lagrange variable for each constraint. For every I, we have now two constraints. One is, I mean, for something complex, which is for which we introduce Lagrange variable alpha I. The other constraint, for about the non-negativity of uh, psi i, we introduce uh, beta i, the, the other constraint beta i, okay? And then now for Lagrangian in this case, it's going to be have a variable w b psi and then beta, so, so we beta means beta one up to beta m. Alpha is defined a similar way. Collect all these alphas. Choose alpha and beta first. Alpha first, and let's define exactly the same recipe. Original objective. followed by psi i plus for every one through m, we this multiply the beta i and minus psi i, the right-hand side of this inequality, the same way we handle for the other this inequality for our i is equal to 1 to m, alpha i, o minus psi i, psi i, double sign plus b. Okay. So that's a Lagrangian. And if we do so, then by exactly the same process, here we can also apply this switching infimoment supremum. And then also, yeah, so switching in moment supremum, the optimization problem that is same as 
uh, supremum over alpha and beta, which are both, I mean, all the non-negative, yeah, it's a vector of non-negative uh, values, then infimum of W B psi, and then Lagrangian W B psi alpha beta. And then we can also put the property on the WB psi alpha beta. But then this property are coming from the KKT conditions. So the, the only property that we add in the transformation of this objective is say derivative of this Lagrangian with respect to the original variable is equal to zero. So, so so what's the property here? It's a derivative gradients of W alpha beta, that has to be zero. And this implies uh, the same thing. So if you take the derivative, it's going to be W plus summation of alpha i minus, alpha i y i x i that is equal to zero. So this will really say w is equal to this condition. That's exactly the one that you see before. And then derivative with b, they're also the same. And that is because, I mean, let me just write it. Beta zero, we do so. Then the only part that appears, B part appears here, and uh, B disappears. So this condition say I is equal to one to M alpha I minus Y I is equal to zero. So that is as before equivalent to saying that alpha I Y I that has to be equal to zero. And now the only extra bit that we add here is for every psi i, because it's also a part of the, the original variables, to say alpha beta has to be zero. So then the, for psi i, this, uh, so this is, I mean, psi i appears here, here, and here. So if you take a derivative, what we get is C is equal to alpha i. Let's just write it here. C is equal to minus beta i minus alpha i is equal to zero. In other words, C is equal to alpha i plus beta i. So that's our condition that we get. So and then there are something that I did mention, which is the other two parts of the condition, which is uh, say for every i, the constraint should hold with inequality, which means when we multiply Lagrange variable, so let's say that beta i minus psi i is equal to zero, and also the same thing, alpha i or minus psi i. I I plus B is to be equal to zero. So these are the two other important property, but I mean what we use in the transformation of this optimization is this. Okay, so if we use this property then and then to plug in, so we, we have a W. Yeah. So we have a W here. And if you plug in W in everywhere, also by using this equality, essentially we can get rid of B and to simplify it. And then the, the last equality say we can replace beta I by alpha I. I mean, these are all imposed in this optimization. 
which will not change the what's going to be achieved by this optimization. So if we do so, and then simplify this, then here's the formula that we get. The formula you get, say that we compute the supremum, and only alpha, because I mean, the last condition said beta i's will be determined by c minus alpha i. So we have a supremum for only alpha, and then the for alpha has to be greater than zero, and then you also have to satisfy this equality from the, I mean, the derivative over b. So alpha i by i has to be equal to zero. And then, but there are just some, a few more. I mean, beta has to be greater than zero. So beta has to be greater than zero. But then beta, if beta i is c minus alpha i, so c minus alpha i has to be greater than zero. So that gives us an upper bound of the of this guy. Okay. So this comes from beta i, which is c minus alpha i greater than zero. So we for every alpha i we have a lower bound as well as upper bound, and then the same constraint as before. But then it turns out the rest will be uh, are exactly the same as the one that we looked at before. So it's a one over half. So it's a minus one over half alpha i alpha j i j y i y j sign and the the other part is summation of i is equal to one to m alpha so that's the I mean, by following the same recipe, I mean the objective that we the dual objective that we will get is this form. And so that's the I mean the SVM for the dual form. For the general case, in your form, so then because we when we have the from the KKT conditions, we have characterization of W. And then also, I mean, these two properties, we can use them to analyze what, I mean, the, how the solution of this supremum problem, I mean, form can lead us to the hyperplane. I mean, what kind of, what's that going to be the definition of the hyperplane? So what we, we're going to talk a little bit more about this uh, dual optimization of SBM for the non-separable case a little bit. And then we will discuss about margin theory in the lecture next Tuesday. Okay, so that's it for today. And thank you very much. And I'm going to stay here about five minutes. So if you have any questions, you can ask me.